All right. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. Yes. yes. All right. Sounds good, everybody. Well, again, um, a small class, but that's all right. I've lectured to, to smaller. So thank you all for bearing the weather here and staying inside. Um, so Valerie, Nadia, and of course, Kimberly and ugh, RJ. Gross. Bro. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so this is AMA's Design for Marketing track. Um, my name is Kent Kerr, I'm a professor of graphic design here, down here at WVU. And my formal discipline in MFA is in design thinking. And that's what I'm going to talk to you all about tonight. So there is a lot of um, nebulous terminology. We'll do our best to define it. And we'll try to make it relevant for both the marketing and the design side of things so that everybody can sort of have a so that everybody can get a little something out of it. This is, by its very nature, a nonlinear and very malleable discipline. So I'm going to challenge everybody to expand your imaginations a little bit and imagine what you can get out of it and how you can apply to it beyond the examples I showed tonight. Uh, I will have a Q&A at the end of this. So um, jot down your questions. And uh, we'll we'll see where it takes us. All right, so let's start with design thinking and what the heck's that all about? It is a nonlinear, non-specific style of creative problem solving that's used to analyze, understand, or solve wicked problems. Now you see wicked problems in quotes. That's sort of an industry term that we use to describe problems that don't have an easy solution or problems that are sort of twisted in on themselves like uh, the Gordian knot. So design thinking as a process is by its very nature and design, nonlinear, nonspecific, human-centered, empathy-driven, open-ended, malleable, and unexpected. <clears throat> sometimes the solution is the process and sometimes the process is the solution. And it's going to serve you best whenever you can pivot at a moment's notice. I have a couple of examples of some research models here that we'll look at in a minute, and you'll get to see how much I had to change just based on one experience. And that could be anything. It could be the weather. It could be uh, people aren't just resonating with your research. And those are all uh, perfectly valid and important experiences. <laughs> There are multiple schools of design thinking. The one I tend to subscribe to is comprised of three key components. That's looking, understanding, and making. These components are empathy-driven. They inform one another and are nonlinear in application. You'll see a lot of double-sided arrows. That's because it's very common to move forward and then have to move back and revisit a process. That also means they can be repeated as necessary, ad infinitum if need be. Ideally, you want to reach some consensus, but you can revisit a topic as many times as necessary. It has a wide range of subcategories and research techniques with each of them. Um, in my office alone, I've got books that account for over 100 unique research methods. And these can all be utilized in unique and exciting ways. And I just went backwards. <clears throat> Here's another way to visualize that, where we try to figure out a problem, understand people, refine a product or process, generate ideas, and prototype. And we loop this in around on itself until we arrive at a amiable solution. Uh, RJ would call that Maya, most advanced yet acceptable. We'll get as close as we can to the problem, and then we'll move on with the understanding that we might have to undo that problem later. <clears throat> there are, of course, a wide range of techniques, steps, research methods beyond what I'm going to talk about tonight. If you want to pursue any of these yourself, I recommend rewatching this. You might try these texts, Innovating for People, Field Guide to Human-Centered Design, 101 Design Methods, and of course, Change by Design full by Tim Brown, which uh, if you follow anything that IDEO does, 
He's a founding member of IDEO. Luma is located in Pittsburgh. You've probably all seen or heard of it. And they use the looking, understanding, and making methods. And these are some of the research techniques that we use in our day to day. And I show you this so you can see, and I'm going to do that more than once tonight. So you can see how these schools of thought, schools of design, change from institution to institution. One isn't better than the other. I'm going to say that whenever you build out these phases, you're ten you tend to be more granular, more modular. Looking, understanding, and making is pretty vague. Observation, ideation, rapid prototyping, user feedback, iteration, implementation, those tend to just be more subsets than large groups. <clears throat> but you will see underlying threads to everything that we're talking about. You want to consider how combining and rearranging your different techniques can be applied to your specific problem. It's not going to mean a whole heck of a lot to anybody if you can't point it towards the problem that you're trying to solve. You want to build off of your previous efforts, let them inform your next steps, or even completely change your line of thinking if need be. And that can be the hardest thing to do whenever you're out in the field, to just let something go and go a completely different direction. So it behooves you to go into the situation and be nonlinear in your approach right from the get-go. Did, did you not understand something as well as you previously thought? That's fine. Revisit what you were just doing with a fresh perspective and let the old stuff go. And there's no such thing as wrong data, only data. You can't help but think of a setback as failure, then fail forward. And keep in mind that no two sessions are identical. We do a lot of branding for communities. Communities, by their very nature, involve different types of people. So by its very design, that is non-identical. And whenever you design a market for different organizations, that's the same. You're going to get a lot of marketing challenges that say, I saw what company A did, and I want that you're not company A. <laughs> so you're not going to get that exactly. You can ape it, but unless it comes from a place of, place of empathy and the people who make it what it is, it's going to ring hollow. And we'll use that to jump us right into human-centered design or the design and design thinking. Whether we realize it or not, graphic designers use design thinking as part of our creative process. So to all in attendance, you do think like this by your very nature, or you should if you allow yourself to. And this was sort of the big revelation for me whenever I pursued the graphic, uh, the design thinking mentality. Whenever you look to identify a need in your design, you're looking at design brief, purpose, client requests, and user needs, social commentary. Whenever we ask you to understand, you're talking about the end user or the market. You need to understand current solutions, trends, competition, understand how users interact with those solutions and why design solutions resonate or alienate your, ba your base. And you make for the end user, whether that's user experience design, client interpretation, physical interaction, think packaging, things that you actually hold or interact with, Make sure your solutions fulfill the needs of your client, and above all else, create with purpose. Why are we making the decisions that we're making? <clears throat> and we do that by exercising an ever-present sense of empathy. And I do want to point out here that this is not the same thing as sympathy. Sympathy involves understanding something or someone from your own perspective. It is cognitive in nature and allows a certain distance to be maintained. Empathy, on the other hand, involves feeling what another person is feeling and trying to understand why from their perspective. It is emotional in nature and requires that human connection. Why is this important? It means that feeling what another person is feeling and why and ensures that we don't force our own experiences or biases onto somebody else. Okay. As designers, it can be very easy to 
go into a client or a fresh situation and say, I'm a big shot graphic designer. I got 20 years of experience. I know what's best for you. And you very well might, but you need to involve your client on some level so that you're meeting their specific needs. You have to empathize with those needs. And this ensures that we consider the human experiment and the human component. If we design for the human experience right from the get-go, whatever you make will have that empathy baked in. And it does not require a shared experience. It allows us to be completely open to someone else's experiences or needs without having to have had them ourselves. And if that is something that you feel, wow, gee, that sounds like something I need to learn to practice, here again are some great reads that you might want to consider. A couple of books on empathy and the art of empathy and how to get it. The Accidental Masterpiece is all about seeing opportunity and failure, and a whole new mind is just exploring and allowing the right-brained mentality to really take you where it takes you. If you're thinking, I'm not reading four books, I can only pick one, I'd say A Whole New Mind by uh, Daniel Pink. <clears throat> Just like design thinking, human-centered design means that we use the same bullet points. We don't force our experiences. We ensure that we consider the human component. And it doesn't require us to have a shared experience. It just means that we have to be open and listen and look. Simple examples of that might be stuff that you do every day as designers and marketers. It might be thumbnail sketching. You generate ideas quickly. You promote divergent thinking. You encourage the sharing of ideas. This is why professors bang on all the time about you filling up a sketchbook and not jumping right into the computer. It's uncomfortable to have somebody staring over your shoulder watching a computer screen. It's easy to pass around a sketchbook. And this helps you make quick iterative improvements based on experience. Also very easy to pass around a pencil. Prototyping promotes a shared vision, helps test ideas quickly, lowers development costs, and helps for iterative improvements. It's something that can, again, be passed around, changed, altered, you name it. And what you're doing by going through that process is you're involving your stakeholders and creating emotional touch points. Involved stakeholders are proud stakeholders. When participants feel heard and see their efforts made real, they will champion the idea. This is an important concept for marketers is to let your clientele and the people that buy into your brand do the marketing for you. It doesn't cost a thing to have somebody share your brand, right? Just to hit retweet. I like this, retweet or share. Whenever you're designing for people, don't be dismissive. Ideas can come from anywhere, especially from people that aren't necessarily designers. Help your participants understand that their efforts, options, and experiences are all important to the process. You might not use it, but you can certainly draw from their experience and weave their data into your narrative. Design for a sense of identity. Think about the very best brands. When done well, people will wear, flaunt, promote, or even champion that brand. That is basically the golden goose for any piece of design, right? The fact that you don't have to try to get people to embrace it. And you do this by creating a positive experience. The process is half the fun. Design with positive experience in mind, both in conception and delivery, and you'll get positive results. <clears throat> Again, involve people, get them to wear your ephemera, get them to be proud of their ephemera, make sure that they're experiencing it in their daily lives, whether it's a cup of coffee, on a shirt, on a tote bag, on a website. Uh, we got people who like to put our logos on Christmas ornaments. Those are all, all good things that a lot of times we don't even have to tell them. They helped with the brand, so they like promoting the brand. And of course, that doesn't have to be branding. Whenever you're talking about creating much emotional touch points, that can be a uniform that somebody's proud of. That can be 
a car or a way to get around that you're excited to see coming up the driveway and not just because they're delivering your dinner. Uh, that could be a fun little experience to open, get some fancy pistachio nuts that have this little little uh, packaging. It opens up like you're you're getting a wedding ring. Um, the people that you work with and play with show their diversity and their experiences on your website. Make your products fun to play with and interact with. Make your stationery enjoyable. The best thing any designer wants to hear is, I ran out of business cards. That means somebody's proud about giving them away. Okay. So what's all that look like in a practical standpoint? Let's look at it in terms of graphics. So we're graphic designers, we're creative people. This is the expectation. This beautiful little Rube Goldberg machine where one idea feeds into the other. You've got this idea, you define it, you test it, you design it, you brand it, you protect it, you make it, you launch it, you sell it, you make a million dollars and off you go. This is more realistic. You're going to start with an idea and it's going to be so poorly defined that you're going to have to explore a ton of different avenues to try to find how you can apply it to your specific problem. So learning to embrace that process right from the get-go and learning that all data is important is critical, not only to make sure that you take away something valuable, but to maintain your sanity. <clears throat> so how do we do that? Ideally, whenever you're doing research for design thinking and applying that to design or marketing respectively, you want to create environments where people feel comfortable to participate. That can be analog. That can be going through boxes of sticky notes that allow people to put ideas up quickly and easily. That can be simple matrices that combine two ideas and allow people to ideate under very controlled environments. So here, how do we engage uh, population based on business? And you can see people will add post-it notes with those, combining those two ideas. Or you can have something like the bullseye diagram where you limit priorities to the central location. Whenever you do something like this, you can only realistically fit five ideas in that space. It's easy for people to think my idea is the most important. That's human nature. They wanna see their own needs fulfilled. But if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And sometimes you have to make decisions that say, I'm gonna tackle this first, this second, and this third. <clears throat> and of course, if you're gonna do something like this, get yourself a little tackle box, fill it with post-it notes and markers and just go to town. These are uh, old erector set boxes, in case anybody's curious what that looks like. In the era of COVID, we got very used to doing this remotely. There are plenty of virtual whiteboards and collaborative environments that allow us to engage for people that can't be there or either by distance or for illness. Muro, Stormboard, Mural, Jamboard uh, are all great solutions, easily shared, and normally offer free uh, workspaces. If your students, all four of these options are free to you with a .edu email, and you might want to look into them. And in case anybody's wondering, Miro is currently my favorite. <clears throat> okay. What do we got here? 720. All right, we're making good time. So design thinking and practice. Design thinking and practice is taking all of the data and all of the experiences that you've gathered up to this point and using it to glean solutions. In the case of Bellevue Believes, we ran a workshop over the course of a year and a half, and it proved strangely prophetic in that it revealed three 
ideas that most everybody could agree on. There needed to be a consistent code enforcement within the community. They wanted to have some beautification in the case of murals, and they wanted to have some unique branding and signage. Strangely enough, right around the time that we started to stumble on the idea of some community placemaking in the case of murals, uh, we had already set into motion making some murals. And it wasn't until a community open house that we were able to reveal not only did the data show that the community wanted this, but we were actively making it. And those two ideas kind of uh, kind of intersected. That is very much a lightning in a bottle situation. I don't want to kind of give the erroneous impression that that always happens that way. But you know you're doing something right if your data can predict what is already going on in the community or within a brand or within a design. The process typically plays out something like this. You gather up your stakeholders, whether they are members of the community, people who are gonna buy your product, uh, board, of the, board of directors, ideally people that hold the purse strings. You want people to be in the room that have the power to make changes. And you guide them through a creative process. What, if you're making a product, what, do you, what would you like to see in a product? What would you like to carry with you day to day? What would you feel comfortable putting on your, uh, putting a decal of on your, your car? And in the case of Hermitage, that resulted in ephemera branding and ultimately a manhole cover design. Had no idea they had infrastructure renovations coming up. Uh, I, RJ and I had mentioned in passing that the logo would look cool on a cookie. And um, we just got to talking that the idea was round and manholes were also round. And that just really stuck with somebody in those meetings. And they came back a couple months later and said, uh, you know, we need some manholes. And I said, go on. <laughs> and uh, there they are. Again, it's not to say that this is necessarily prophetic. It's to let you know that you want people who are involved in whatever it is you do, because we wouldn't have known from anything else that this sort of need was there. The stakeholders had to tell us, and really all the stakeholders needed from us was a platform in which to reveal those ideas. Similar process for Liberty, two very different solutions. I'll refer you back to my uh, previous comment where subject A wants what subject B has, and that's not realistic. These two communities couldn't be any more different. So their solutions are gonna be very different. Uh, Bright needed a rename in addition to a rebrand. So a lot of this was finding interesting wording and language and kind of a shared vocabulary within this group of engineers who uh, could come up with this name that they could really rally behind. T-Bike is actually an acronym, Technology Belt Energy Innovation Center. And nobody liked having to explain that. So, uh, everybody kind of liked Bright. We went with Bright. This was interesting in the because again, it was all engineers and a little something about engineers. No sense of humor. None. They're the most literal people in the world. Jokes don't work. Uh, common colloquialisms don't work. Just play it as straight as you can because that's the only way you're going to get anything out of these people.
but the solution was very well received. Uh, we created some wonderful emotional touch points. You can see their brand from the streets. You can see it in the halls. You can see it in their ephemera. Um, we get photos now and now and then showing them. Uh, they made a little logo for their Christmas tree, just stuff like that. So when you've done your job right, people want to champion your brand. And if they feel like they've had a part in it, which they literally have, uh, you really don't have to convince them to use it. So that all being said, how can you use it? Start small. I don't expect anybody to be able to do this as efficiently as I or RJ or any of the myriad of people that practice this stuff. So ask yourself, is your target people? Then involve them. Is your target packaging or marketing? Then look at packaging, look at marketing. Design thinking is designed to democratize the process. This allows everyone's input to be counted, even if it's not the end all be all end idea that's sort of being used, it ensures that their input is counted. Allows opinions and insights to be anonymous. Everybody's input is equally important. This is important because if you've ever been to, I use the, uh, community session several times, but if you've ever been to heck a committee, there's always, everybody can point to the loud mouth. Just, right, just that person is gonna start running their mouth the moment they start the minutes and nobody's gonna get a word in edgewise. And likewise, you can always point to the wallflowers because they don't wanna engage. If everybody's insight and opinions are anonymous, it empowers people that might not otherwise participate, participate, and it quiets down the, the noisy people. It encourages engagement and ownership. Everyone shares, so everyone cares. And it creates an environment for sharing insights and experience. Want people to talk? Make them feel heard. I know that sounds like, well, duh, right? You'd, you'd be surprised. You want people to talk? Make them feel heard. I only provide these examples so we can see that this takes many forms. This might be a boardroom. This might be post-it notes on foam core. This might be getting into the pins in string. This might be prototyping. I've got a couple of seniors that are prototyping smartphone apps. I see you guys. It might be meeting in a coffee shop. Uh, for Bellevue specifically, I conducted at least 25 interviews and they were all done at a coffee shop just because, heck yeah, I'll go and have a cup of coffee and a scone and talk to you for a half an hour right on, you know, especially when I'm buying, right? It's just, oh, you're buying? Yeah. You know, I can get you out of bed. Uh -huh. Why not? What else were you going to do with that, with that half an hour in the morning, right? <clears throat> can't get people together, send out a survey. If it's something like branding, what resonates with you? If we're doing a logo, what style do you like? What three characteristics would like you like to see in a, a brand for yourself or a company or a product? Do you want it to be unique, beautiful, humble, diverse? What two colors feel represent you? Most, maybe more importantly, what two colors do you feel don't represent you? You'd be surprised how often that comes up. Uh, you're all from the Pittsburgh area. You either really, really, really like Pittsburgh and black and gold on everything, or you really, really, really don't want to just be another black and gold city. You want to be your own thing. And... If you go in and you assume, then you're going to miss that very important point. Going to come back with some black and gold and people are just going to groan at you. 
and WVU is kind of the same, right? We have uh, colors here, blue and gold. Doesn't mean you want to see it everywhere all the time. Because what's the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth? How are you affiliated with the school? No, you know, but sometimes you can't get away from that. <laughs> Visualize that data. Numbers are one thing. Letting people see where data overlaps and how it builds out is entirely something different. This lets them see how their ideas are connected. This lets them see commonality. Maybe we can see terms that are repeated over and over and over again, and suddenly, oh, wow, more than just me have this opinion. Maybe I'm onto something. Maybe I'm smarter than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. That's a good feeling, right? And it reminds us that we have more similarities than we do differences. <clears throat> and apply those results. If safety, stability, and growing came up multiple times, show that in your solution. Say, by using this typeface or using this imagery or using these colors, I'm alluding to or creating metaphorical stability, safety, growing. It's circular. It's communal. Nature, sun, community, again, circular. Green and blue. Geographic, recreation. And on and on it goes. I won't read them all. And more importantly, show them in the hands or people, or at least give them an idea of what this looks like if they were to rock it. Like if you're going to design a brand or design a product and it's for people and it's going to be used by people, then what's it look like for, on people, for people? As creatives, you kind of have to remind yourself on a regular basis that very likely the people that you're working with aren't as imaginative as you. You might be able to imagine a logo or a design on a bag or a coat, or whatever. These people aren't trained to visualize the way you are. Taking five minutes to mock something up can be the difference between selling something or not. And it's less because they're not creative and more because you're involving them in the process and you're showing them that it's a human experience. <clears throat> that being said, on the topic of people, people aren't perfect. So don't expect perfect results. It is a very realistic possibility that you might not get the information you need. Try a different method. It's very possible the one you tried just simply didn't resonate or was misunderstood. Uh, Bright, formerly T-Bike, that was a hard lesson. We had a, the first time we ran with T-Bike, we fell flat on our faces because just what we were trying to do and the way we were trying to running just did not resonate with these very analytical, perfectionist, precision minds. We had to break it down into much simpler terms and just hit them differently. And the second one was way more successful. You might get too much information. Uh, that's kind of a good problem to have. You're going to spend your time sorting through more info, but you can do that down the road. Get, you get your data. Don't get discouraged if you sort of get a bit of a word salad right from the get-go. There's some good bits in there. It's like uh, digging the bacon bits out of a salad. You got to find the good bits. You might not get a definitive answer. That is normal. Most questions don't have a straight answer. If they did, there wouldn't be questions. And that applies to just about everything. Marketing, designers, et cetera. There wouldn't be marketing, marketeers, designers, if there was a definitive answer. Pepsi just rebranded. They didn't have to. They did because there was a better solution out there. 
their other one was arguably just fine. But it's a growing process. It's an evolving answer. That's the reason you see like computer mice iterate. There's always new versions of hardware coming out. It's because the solution that's in place is a good enough solution, and that's fine. Are you afraid to fail or think you've already failed? That's cool. You learn more from failure than you do with success. Just remember to fail forward. <laughs> yeah, so literal, so painful. So here. I promised uh, I promised you an example of whenever I put my foot in it. So this is from my my master's thesis, and this was my very well planned research model. And as early as the first session, I had to change it. This was not going to work the way it was written. I had to modify it. I had to update my language. I had to add steps. I had to remove steps. If I wouldn't have allowed myself that flexibility, I the whole project would have probably fallen apart, quite frankly, because nobody's going to follow you along while you're antagonizing over your failures. You just need to punch through it and make the best of the situation and say, hey, this one didn't work so great. We know what to do for next time, and next time you kill it. And I want to be clear, the reason a lot of these didn't land, like the first night, was language. We needed to listen to our, our audience. We needed to respond to the people participating. And if you aren't listening, you're not hearing. So we have two eyes, two ears, one mouth. We should use them in that proportion. All right, getting down to business. Practically speaking, let's say you don't want to run a big old workshop or you just want to know what the brass tacks are here and just I've got a handful of little things. I don't have a I don't have six months to a year to run big research. What can I do in the short term? Look at your competition, do some audits, ask questions that might not necessarily be at the forefront. So in this case, we're doing inversion research. We are looking at what is and isn't already there. So do a marketing audit on whoever it is you're looking at and ask what that big picture is. What's the five-year goal? What's the 10-year goal? Shoot, if it's a small startup, what's the five-month goal, right? And that can really drastically change how you approach your design, how you approach your social media strategy, where you're applying your strategies, et cetera. Do a competitive audit. Do you have a product? What is the marketplace? What does that look like? What's the competition doing? What do you need to do to stand out? If everybody's zigging, what do you need to do to zag? I use the, uh, the soda brand here. I cannot off the top of my head think of a more daunting exercise than to come up with a soda pop design, a soda brand in an already very competitive field. Can you imagine trying to stand out on that shelf? Do an IP audit, intellectual properties audit. All right, do you have to design within a system? If so, where are those limitations? What intellectual properties define that brand, that product, et cetera? Do a language audit. How does the company, community, design have to say about itself? Is it confident, ambitious, passionate, educational, steadfast, risky? And do a process audit. Is the process part of the brand's success or a point of failure? And how can you process, how can your process strengthen your design and avoid failure? 
So borrowing anything that I've talked about up until this point, you can always look to your competition. You can always look to what already exists. And you can ask, how can I stand out in that field? How can I improve this brand? How can I innovate within this space? And that comes down to asking questions. That comes down to looking. One of the big three for looking, understanding, and making. You look, you get a better understanding, then you make your solution. If your solution doesn't work, maybe you misunderstood something. You go back, you relook, you refine your understanding, you make again. Sounds an awful lot like the design process, doesn't it? Just saying. You guys know this stuff intuitively. Analysis requires an ability to listen, read between the lines, observe what others don't see, see patterns, make connections, and identify opportunities. That's all design is. That's all design thinking is. You just have to let yourself open to it and let yourself hear things that people are saying, let yourself see things that other peoples aren't seeing. There we go. Q&A time. I know we got a small group here. That means you get to ask more questions. You like that? Good. <laughs> <laughs> ask more or none. Uh, or none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you guys are just like, oh, God, I'm sick of hearing this guy talk. I think they're sick of hearing me talk. I, I have mean, a question. Yes, Nadia. How, how long does it usually take you to, like, brainstorm on a specific idea? And how often do you usually do it? Do you do it every day or once a week? Oh, good question. Um, so I'm going to say that based, is based on the complexity of the problem. If you're dealing with something really complex with a lot of moving parts, like community branding that involves thousands of residents, uh, you're going to be looking at six months to 12 months to maybe 18 months to get a appropriate sample size. If you're looking at a brand for a small company that involves maybe five board members, you can probably cover that in a couple of weeks to a couple months. And mm -hmm. keep in mind that isn't like a solid couple of weeks or a solid couple of months. You might be meeting with them every Friday. Mm -hmm. As far as brainstorming is concerned, I would say sketch when the muse hits you, rest when you need to. Mm -hmm. Ideas come better to a rested mind and uh, do what makes you feel creative. Uh, whether that's going outside and get some air, the weather's getting nice, or that means watching cartoons. What do you, whatever you need to do. Okay, thank you. Sure. It's actually really good advice to build in some of those, you know, things that that entertain you, that let you go a little mindless. Because, you know, if you're a designer, then you're kind of cursed with the fact that your brain is always working on trying to solve a problem, be it a design one or not. Uh, that's just kind of the, the nature of the, of the designer, right? So when you are able to tune into those things that entertain you and you're not consciously thinking about the problem, sometimes you're subconscious out of nowhere, you're able to solve like a really complex problem. And the answer was like right in front of you the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And I would get, I'm going to say like designers by our nature, we tend to be very pragmatic people. So we're typically always on the edge of a knife, trying like brain is sort of processing. So whenever your mind does go quiet, let it happen. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy your downtime because it, uh, it doesn't happen all that often. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kent. This was great as always. And, uh, Really appreciate your your time and and you know insight into this. I think that you know design thinking is absolutely a uh, a skill set that all de designers need to develop. And the changes in design curriculum across the the country 
you know, are starting to reflect that. So work smarter, not harder, the better your, your research, the better your solutions. Yeah. And I do want to, I do want to clarify on that. So there's certainly, there's certainly a, a, a camp out here that think like the design thinking is sort of this, it's like a, a trend or a fad. And if you're looking to it to solve all of your problems, then yes, it is absolutely that. If you are looking at it as a developed skill set and how you apply it is based, is kind of like how you wield a, be the equivalent of wielding like a knife. Let's say you're a chef and you have a finely tuned tool. That's what design thinking should be. It's not a magic bullet. And so just, yeah, I, I just, I always hear like oh, design thinking is this or that. And it's like, it's a skill like anything else. Allow it to be a skill. <laughs> That's exactly. So awesome. Well, uh, thanks again. This was great. Oh, you were quite welcome. Um, one, one last call for for questions. We had one from Nadia. You want to sneak one in here, Valerie? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> She's processing.